up next, we've got uh, Lewis, and he's going to be doing his talk on what is domain-driven design and how it can help. Over to you, Lewis, mate. All right, so yeah, I've got a talk about um, domain-driven design. It's a practice which I've used the last few years and um, bring to the company I'm working at now, Banked. Um, it's an architectural practice for um, helping align your uh, architecture with your business. Uh, but let's uh, I'll go into the talk and we'll get from there. So uh, I'm a lead engineer at Bank. Um, at Bank, sorry, at Bank. Uh, I've been here uh, since the uh, middle of last year. Um, so originally, uh, I actually started my, uh, I actually went to art college in the year 2000. Um, worked in retail for a while where I kind of got into IT by supporting tills and um, office computers. And then I moved into application support. I worked in a company called Gorkana. They're called Decision nowadays. They were called Gorkana um, up to about 2016. And they are a media intelligence company. I work there, application support. And I'd say it's proper old school IT company with um, servers on horrible VM boxes and things. Uh, I actually went to a coding bootcamp, Makers Academy, in 2015 because I decided I wanted to be a software engineer. Did that and then moved into uh, being a software engineer or developer, like they called it back then. Um, worked at uh, Sydney Business for six, about six years, and that's where I learned about domain driven design and um, some of the stuff I speak to today. Uh, worked at Smart Pension briefly, and now I'm at Banks. Uh, predominantly been a Ruby engineer, uh, but I'm now working with uh, Go at Banks. Uh, so, Banks, if you've uh, never heard of us before, we are a um, Payments company, we offer an open banking payment solution via the checkout. So it's interesting to say that Tolly has issues with uh, people that have to use multi cards for um, payments for cars. This is this solution that would not be a problem because what we do is we, so if you see us in the checkout and you get to use this technology, it initiates uh, instant payment using open banking APIs and allows the customer to pay via the bank account. So it will load up, um, so basically, this is a demo to check out here. They get to choose their bank. It will then take them into their banking application. And then they approve the transfer and then the payment is made. Um, it, it's, uh, it's the way I kind of, think of it is if you had to design payments today and cards never existed this is probably what you'd come up with cards were never designed for um online shopping uh, they're bits of plastic you keep in your wallet it's got some numbers on it that if someone steals they can get access to your money uh, this is a has much lower cost to merchants the money transfers instantly uh, there's no um, waiting time it just transfers from one bank account to another uh, it's more secure as well because it's using that security, which is on your banking application, which is typically biometric nowadays to actually uh, authorize that payment. So that's what that's what banks does. If you're more interested in banks, look us up online. Um, yeah. Uh, so domain from design. Let's get into this. Cool. So this is quite, quite an interesting quote. Uh, quite like which I think this, this Douglas Martin is actually a, a graphic designer, a designer, but not actually anything to do with software. But the, um, so questions about design is necessary, sorry, question about whether design is necessary or affordable are quite beside the point. Design is inevitable. Alternative to good design is bad design, not no design at all. And I think this kind of, this is actually in the main driven design books. They, they have this quote, uh, but it's, it's basically saying that bad design will happen if you don't design. You can't not design. And with software architecture, you need to design. And domain-driven design is a technique for that. Uh, so this is this is uh, my favorite 
the Mandarin Design book. It's the one I recommend everyone read because you can see my camera, but it's quite small, not too big. Um, it's a post-it note to need to make this talk, but um, it's not too big. And uh, it kind of encapsulates the strategy of the of Design. So if we want to quest for deep learning about how the business works, then to model software based on the extent of our learning. So it's a Vaughan Vernon's Domain Driven Design Distillers. This is the one I uh, recommend. Um, so before we get into that, um, what happens without design? So you don't design the system, what kind of things can happen? And I think engineers here, this is probably um, something you've probably seen at companies you've worked at. Um, software development is something to do with a cost center. Um, uh, developers are wrapped up in, in technology. They, they care about using the, the new technology which interests them rather than the problem space. Um, database, uh, giving too much priority solutions around um, the database, not the model. I've not actually seen that for quite a few years, actually, but when I was at Gorkana, there was all kinds of stored procedures and other stuff and databases that didn't look this logic. Um, developers don't emphasize naming objects. This is a big one you see where the, the, the objects in the database don't represent what they are in the kind of mental model of the actual subject matter experts. Um, poor collaboration uh, between, this can be between engineering teams, but tends to be between uh, company departments and engineers. Uh, project estimates in high demand, I think that's a, that's a big one, which you see all the time. Uh, it's always, even before you, like there's estimates, even before you pick work up, there's, there's estimates of what you'll do. Uh, there'll be a problem that a product manager or someone's found. There's, a, there's like an estimate of how long they think it will be to fix or just some new feature they want integrated. Uh, business logic is in user interface um, persistence components. It's definitely something I see a lot, especially coming from a Ruby background where I've got to work on Rails um, code bases a lot. People kind of think, well, where's it going to go? I don't really know where to put this thing. So it tends to either go in the user interface or the model. Um, broken, slow locking database queries. Uh, that tends to be because um, some operation needs to happen and uh, several database tables or many different parts of the system needs to update in one place because um, it's, well, we'll go into what it is later, but it's a, a bit of a mess. And uh, wrong abstractions and um, strongly coupled services, services where um, there's too much, to basically what well, uh, one bit of logic is split between two services, there's, or a domain is split, where it's, where it's uh, not a very nice um, abstraction, which makes it, it means you need to update one service. Sorry, you have to, have to update many services to get one job done. Yeah. And then what, and what tends to happen when you do all that is you get this, this thing. I don't think it's, this came from domain and design, but there's the concept of the big ball of mud, which is, so what I've tried to kind to illustrate with this slide is you, you're doing all your agile stuff properly, you're doing your product backlog, your sprint tasks, or what, however you do it, and you still end up with a big ball of mud because you may be you may be, you may be shipping features in small, um, uh, fast, uh, um, well-defined uh, like. PRs and everything, everything's working fast in the CICF, CD pipeline, but eventually it all just creates a big ball of mud and it becomes harder and harder for people to really understand what is going on, what does what and how do things relate. And just to point out, um, I could have done a diagram with many small balls of mud. Um, this, isn't, this isn't a uh, problem, this is just for monoliths. This is a problem which also happens with microservices as well. So it's, yeah, the ball of mud is where you don't want to be, where you don't really know what's happening. And your, domain, your, ab, your application domain is very mixed and very difficult to understand. Uh, so how can the engine design help? So let's get into some of this. Uh, um, so there's two parts of uh, domain driven design. It's kind of strategic and tactical. This is the original book by Ed, uh, Eric Evans. Um, what kind of something I've kind of heard from other 
people interested in domain driven design is kind of the problems with this book. So the strategic is kind of how teams and businesses work together. And the tactical is the implementation. And that's the cool stuff that engineers like uh, CQRS systems and event driven software and um, uh, really interesting mechanisms for updating um, state and things like that. So what kind of the problem with this book is that it emphasizes the tactical at the start of the book and the engineers reading, oh, this is brilliant. I want to work a CQRS system. I want to do an event driven system. But it doesn't emphasize the strategic till the end. And a lot of people don't even, don't even read that, don't get that far. So you start implementing these kind of very sophisticated, expensive systems without really having the, the strategic part, which is the part I kind of care about a lot is why are you doing this and how does it actually relate to what the, the domain you're working in or the domains you're working in. So this talk, I'm going to focus on the strategic part. I think it's, for me, it's the most important, maybe because I work in a more kind of product engineering world where I'm, I'm trying to work with um, businesses to solve problems. But I think it, it, it um, I find it's a real uh, strong way of guiding um, how the engineering teams and the product will work together. So yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to emphasize. Um, yeah, cool. So yeah, I, I, I took a photo of the book for this image. I hope that's, hope that's okay. Uh, so um, this is kind of the main concept I'm kind of trying to talk about is, um, is you want engineers and domain experts to work together to design software. So this kind of illustration here, you've got your developer here and their heads full of computers and um, computer stuff. And the domain experts just care about money. I'm sure that's not true. It's more about they, they care about the business and the, the subject matter experts care about what is that the, what's actually happening. Um, and the whole point here is to actually align the way these two people, these two groups of people think. So the main strategic principles of domain and design are the core domain, bounded contexts, and um, ubiquitous language. So we get into this, the core domain, so that's your software model that is most important because it needs to achieve greatness. Uh, a core domain is developed to distinguish your organization completely from others and makes it clear what you should focus on. So it's kind of the thing that if you put your energy into, it's gonna make you the most money really. It's, it's, it's what's unique about your business and what's gonna give you value. Uh, so this is kind of like my, really contrived diagram of, let's say it's like, this isn't banked, but let's say it kind of is. Um, and so we've got some, some of the domains we may have a bank. So we've got a marketing website with all our stuff on that about how to use the product and the jobs we've got there and um, things like that. Uh, we've got payments, which is where we want to put our focus. That's our core domain. And then we've got our user management, which is a generic domain. So yeah, marketing website, supporting domain, we're not gonna to put too much effort in that, we're probably just gonna use some off-the-shelf CMS. User management, generic domain, we're probably either gonna build services with third-party libraries or use some kind of third-party service and use as much as that as we want. There's not, there's not really much value for us putting our effort into making that unique and special because it's not gonna get more money through the door. But payments, that's our core domain. So that's where we really are going to focus everything. And that's where we want to spend most of our time. And I think this is an interesting one to just kind of think about when you are looking at new features or looking at new jobs that are coming up for tasks coming up in your roadmaps. Is, it's a good way of like trying to work out where you want to put your engineering effort. Like the core domain is definitely the one where you need to for most of it. You obviously need the other ones because you wouldn't be able to exist, but core domain is most important. Um, so bounded context. So within domains, you do split the um, domains into bounded context. So they're kind of like a subdomain almost. That's kind of one way of thinking of them. But the bounded contexts are, are bounded in terms of the a place where there's kind of business terms and um, there's something called a ubiquitous language which exists inside it. So I've tried to kind of um, 
draw a kind of diagram for this, kind of like two kind of hypothetical domains. So we have a domain on the sorry, context, sorry, we've got bounded context on the left called payments, one on the right called billing. Uh, so inside the payments bounded context, it's got its own ubiquitous language. So it's got concepts such as line items and payer, amount and bank account. And it's also got a business. And in the billing bounded context, it's, that's also got its own um, kind of concepts. Uh, and a business is the same one. But a business in, in terms of payments is the, it will be the same ref, it will have reference to the same object inside the billing bounded context, but it would be it could be a slightly different model in the way it's um, modeled in the code because it has different needs in the billing context. A, a business um, amount, for example, is not the same as a payments amount. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is once you start um, event story, which I'm going to talk about next. Um, the language you build for each of your bounded contexts is ubiquitous and unique just for that. So in terms of um, your kind of different, like these, I don't want to get too far ahead, but these things will turn into kind of systems or uh, models in your software. And you may have the same terms for the same, for different things, because the ubiquitous language is always unique inside the banner context. Sorry, I get a bit waffly with that one. Uh, so event storming, um, this is probably the most valuable thing from the main driven design I find. Um, it's, um, it's a kind of uh, process you go through with um, a group of people to actually model out your domain or understand your domain. So it's a rapid design technique and to engage both domain experts and engineers. Um, it focuses on events and business processes rather than close classes and databases. Um, it's a visual approach, it's everyone in level footing, and it's fast and cheap to perform, and a team will have breakthroughs in understanding. So we used to do this quite a lot when I was at Simply Business um, in person, because it was before the COVID um, pandemic. So we used to get everyone in a room and um, go for an event storming process. Uh, and what was really useful, so uh, that company had a big call center in Northampton. And we were, the team I was on at the time, we were going through um, processes that the like, kind of certain teams in the call center had to do, and we were modeling it into our system. So we actually used to get several of the people from the call center to come down and uh, go through the process with them. So when you kind of build your event storming kind of groups to do this, get your subject matter experts in from the parts of the business that do this sort of thing. That's, that's kind of one of the most important things. So it's a, a good mix of engineers, product managers, uh, UI, because uh, if it's a kind of UI based thing and especially the subject matter experts. So you can build that ubiquitous language and you can build that domain. So how does event storming work? So yeah, like I say, you used to do it on a wall, but now try and find a digital tool to do this. Um, Notion's quite good. You can probably use Whimsical as well, or Jamboard, but whatever, whatever suits you. Um, but yeah, basically, when you've got um, kind of a domain you want to model out, the event storm process is what you do. So first thing, draw a line on the, the time, which is uh, left to right, so things that happen along the timeline. Um, and so this is what I'm going to do here is going to be kind of a contrived example of like one of the kind of hypothetical things that can happen in banks for, um, with payments and rewards. So um, the first step of event storming um, is to market the events. So events are things that have happened and put them down in a timeline that they happen in. So uh, it, uh, different color per element and collaborate and question each stage. Uh, yeah, so events are gonna be blue. Um, and it's important that these events come from the subject matter experts. And then if what I find is good for engineers is actually to challenge when they happen and, it, it, and what order they happen. And, and, and like, for example, here, we've got an event to say a payment's created. Um, 
and then we've got a payment attempt failed and a payment attempt successful. So it's good to challenge business on what the actual edge cases are with these sort of things. And um, we've got the fraud exception as an event. So once you've got your events kind of uh, mapped out, you then map in the commands. Um, so commands are the, uh, the trigger that would make the event happen. So uh, for payments, we've got a create payment commands. Uh, we've got a process payment attempt, which actually can trigger two events. And um, we've got accept rewards, which can trigger the um, reward accepted. Uh, I think people probably who do work on event driven systems can see that domain driven design does map very well to event driven systems already. Um, and then once you've got your commands and events, it's now time to um, think about uh, the aggregates, which will um, kind of be the objects which are responsible for the aggregation of these commands and events. Uh, a good kind of rule of thumb to work out if it should be in the same aggregate or not is if um, something happens um, has to happen at the same time. So if an update has to happen at the same time or it has to happen afterwards. And it's also good to challenge that inside of the, um, good thing to really challenge the kind of business in these kind of sessions. Um, so for example, uh, um, does, so we, we get, a, so we've got this reward um, aggregate, for example, and say, so, oh, do, do we have to update the reward um, when a payment at exactly the same time that a payment attempt successful comes in. So no, that, that doesn't have to happen immediately. So then that would be on a different aggregate and we'll do that asynchronously. Um, how does that make sense? So this is kind of weird. That might, might not make sense to what I'm trying to model here, <laughs> but um, we've got a concept of banks that we create payments, um, which is kind of a record of the state of the payment and then uh, transaction is kind of where the payment will go to the bank and um, do all the open banking stuff to uh, um, resolve the payment. And then reward is something we have off from top. We offer Avios, for example, and then uh, um, if someone in the checkout adds that on, we add that. But this is super simplified. If any of my colleagues are watching this, especially people who work in the Payment Slayer, they've been quite offended that I've really simplified their domain to just this little box, which is, is super, super complicated. Um, okay, so event storing. Uh, it's used, used to perform sessions with team to accelerate modeling efforts. Uh, I recommend starting with short sessions to two hours at the very max. Um, don't get bogged down with edge cases. So this is a uh, thing I've noticed before and I've done these is you get questions, you, you get stuck at some kind of question that comes up near the start. And a lot of people will put their energy in trying to answer that question, which will just take time. It's better to write that down, assign that to someone to solve, not now, afterwards, and then just move on and get the rest of it um, fleshed out. And then what you tend to find as well is you might event store a process and then do the event storing process again during the product life cycle. So, I doubt you would, unless you're really good and it's really simple, you'd do one event storming process, map out your domain, and then model that into software immediately. Probably would do one and then um, maybe spike out your architecture, those kind of things, and then go back into the event storming again. And it's also good to do it after you, while you're implementing as well, because things will change. And then you can also kind of change the area of detail you go into. So rather than doing it on such a big kind of grand scope, you can like just focus in on one small piece, especially as you start to get more edge cases. Um, and you might have kind of noticed um, domain driven design does map onto the CQRS command query response segregation architecture. And a lot of the um, documentation and the implementation of Domain driven design is basically CQRS. Um, aggregates are called aggregates because they aggregate state. Um, robustness is built into these architectures. They're ordered, they're eventually consistent, uh, negate race condition. Uh, retries are built in, and they horizontal scaling via uh, message uh, consumers and publishers. 
and um, you can get query efficiency by using read models. So rather than just reading the state from your aggregates, you can use um, read models to um, if you need to build APIs to retrieve data and things like that. So I didn't want to go too much into CQRS. I'm not a CQRS expert. And I, I want to try and get the most out of this talk is about trying to express why you should do event storming and speak to your business and model out your solutions. But I did make a stab at it anyway. So um, this is obviously, again, contrived example. Um, but so for example, we were to take that uh, event storming session I made up with myself and try and build out some architecture. This is this may be what I came up with. So we have an API. This we actually do have an API where you can create payments. Um, so rather, so what we do is uh, we'd have some kind of HTTP endpoint which would then publish um, the create payment command onto the message bus, Kafka or um, whatever you want to use, um, and the uh, that would then publish. So the idea of kind of CQRS, sorry, let's start again. So API gets a request to create a payment, create payment command comes in, that's picked up by the aggregate. The aggregate applies that and then um, publishes the payment created event. Um, and then we've got a checkout API. So this is the thing which um, on the, on the uh, first slide I showed you the demo, that's actually what the, the SDK is in the the embedded checkouts would call. Uh, so payment attempts come in, uh, that would go in the message bus. Um, to say payment attempt comes in. Transaction aggregate would go and do all of the stuff that needs to do. There'd probably be a lot more stuff behind that because there's a lot more stuff involved in the open banking flow. Um, and the payment attempt successful event is triggered. Uh, we have a process manager here, which would pick up the payment attempt successful event and then uh, that would the this complete payment command will be sent to the payment to mark that as completed to the account in the United State. And then we also got this uh, reward accepted. So that would also come from the checkout API and that would stick it on the um, reward aggregate. So this is kind of how you, this is just one way you could model this into an event driven system or a CQRS system. And uh, the great thing about domain driven design is all of the commands and events are real business things. So once you start looking at login and uh, um, all that other stuff, you're actually um, looking at it. Um, you've, actually, you've actually got the kind of business terms in there rather than the um, rather than just being event rather than being events that engineers have come up with. Uh, how do I go back to that? Sorry. So. So with your observability tools or your kind of uh, an analytics data, you know, that, these are all real things. And uh, that really does help when, when you get questions from the business, like what's happened, what to just kind of understand what's happened or just to add features. Like um, if we want to send a receipt after payments are created, how can we do that? And it just makes everyone's life a bit easier when they look at the code base because they're all speaking the same language. Everything's made the same thing. Um, <coughs> just got a little slide about CQRS. Um, commands are um, a statement of intent. They do something. Um, uh, they're only handled by one aggregate. So just go back a sec. Um, do any handle one aggregate or, or process manager? No, sorry, I can't. Ask. Yeah, so the, the commands are only sent to one thing. You wouldn't, you wouldn't um, have a command which is picked up by multiple consumers. It's just one thing picks it up and actions it. Um, and the result of the command is published as an event. Events are past statements of something that has happened, and they can be handled or consumed by multiple consumers. So what what I've not done in that diagram, but what it's a good pattern is you, you, may, you may, for example, be publishing um, these payment complete events and you'll have a consumer which just picks those up, builds a read model, which is just a separate database table where it puts them in and then you can put an API on top of that if you want to retrieve your data. So you're, you're not touching the aggregate state, which you shouldn't touch the aggregate state. Um, but I did, so I did want to not 
tie this talk into CQRS or event-driven kind of software. And I, I do worry that there's a lot of value in brain-driven design, and I don't want teams to be held off if they haven't got the size or the scope or the or the, or the time to really um, do that. So I should, this is kind of interesting. Bear with me on this one. But I've tried to like like take you can you you can use these um, ideas and build non-event driven architecture, non CQRS architecture. You can do it. So I've, I've worked, like I said, in, in Ruby on Rails and previous companies, and um, still do a bit. And like, don't let not not having the event buses and the consumer knowledge um, or time to learn that knowledge holds you back. So I've kind of tried to see if you can kind of model it. So you can carry on with the main driven design sessions and the, and the event storming and use that to inform how you would build, uh, how you would name and build the models in your um, CRUD app or your um, uh, typical um, architecture. So, for example, what I've tried to do here, so for example, you could just have a basic API controller, it could be a Rails controller, um, but the, the method it calls on the payments model is create payment. So the, the, the synchronous method is your command, um, and that could set a state, payment created, and uh, on the checkout, the same thing, checkout API calls attempt payment on the um, transaction model, that sets the state of, the, of this transaction inst instance to be um, successful. Uh, and then it could trigger an async job. And you can use, if that, if you're using Rails, you do something like Sidekick, which would then update the payment model. So, yeah, I'm trying to say, don't let it hold you back and see, yeah, see if you can carry on with the event storming, but use it in your kind of traditional architecture. Um, okay, okay, so this is coming to the end now. So, cool. So, summary uh, without design we end up with a big ball of mud. We're not going to say we may, I just think we will. Uh, range of design is a technique for aligning software with business. Uh, collaboration and strategic alignment are fundamental to success and a uh, ubiquitous language exists in the domain. Uh, event storming is a technique for learning about domain and architecture. Uh, DED does map onto reactive architecture well, and uh, there's value in range of design and event storming even if you can't use or don't want the Benjamin architecture. So I think that's the end. Cool. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Lewis. I'd just, like to, just like to point out and um, like say well done even more, because I think you put that talk together and uh, everything in under a week uh, stepped in after, uh, you know, very, very last minute. So really well done, mate. It smashed it. Um, hand it over to uh, Martin to uh, for the questions on Slido. Cheers. Cheers, Isaac. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. It's a really good talk. And again, like Isaac said, last minute and you pulled it all together very, very quickly. So thanks for, for helping us out on that. Um, got some questions here if you're okay to answer them. Um, first one I've got is, is there such a thing as domain-driven refactoring? So... Um, have you had many successes trying to apply the principles after the, the mud balls are formed? So I guess that's a really good question. If somebody's just rushed in, you know, for various reasons, uh, you've got a problem there. Are there patterns there to get you out of that? Are there, are there processes and approaches you can take to get yourself out of that with DDD? Yeah, I think I think that's actually quite common, actually, because it's it's things do tend to get built, especially because every, every company was a startup eventually, uh, originally and things were built in, a, in that kind of way. And then you come in and you, and then you have to work out backwards. Um, I don't know if I have a solution um, apart from, um, well, there's, there's certain things you can do, but you, uh, first obviously do the, do the, do the event storing for anything new you're going to do. It's, it's difficult, unless, unless you're small enough and you can like do a big refactor, which I don't think many people can, but do, do a kind of event storm on anything kind of small uh, first. Like don't do this on anything that exists and try and rebuild the world. If, if, you, if you're starting on another kind of feature where you can do this, do this and kind of, and it can be something really small, something really simple just to kind of, 
and it just to kind of um get some experience of it I, I know like i did kind of talk about how you don't want to put too much energy into a supporting domain but actually you might find that a supporting domain might be you might want to companies always rebuild the way they send emails or webhooks it might be good just to take one of those and do that and do a nice kind of domain driven kind of um solution to that and when you've done that you'll have a bit of knowledge about how it works and whether you like maybe, maybe you don't like this maybe it's all nonsense but you'll have some knowledge about whether you like it and then and also some understanding how to do it and then you can approach the bigger kind of problem and um start thinking about how you would kind of boundary off and kind of mask um interfaces um i think it's not really dimensional design but i really like I've, I've, heard Sam Newman talk about it a lot is the strangler fig pattern where you kind of um if you've got a monolith or kind of this uh, older architecture you kind of build a new architecture around it and you have boundaries to the old one and it eventually it kind of takes over but that's yeah I hope that's what I'd kind of suggest yeah so don't try and boil the ocean just chip yeah. away uh, presumably just a little bit beyond what you're going to develop with. So you, you've got a little bit more of an understanding, but don't feel you have to, you know, tackle the whole domain at once. Um, next question, are there the words considered too generic to be helpful when naming elements, or do you ensure they have a prefix, suffix? So e.g. account service. So I presume this is where, where words get, you know, they're, they're too generic to be useful perhaps. What's your advice around that? Have you, have you tackled things like that? Um, well, it's, it all depends. But that, I suppose my slides were quite contrived because I just kind of made them up. <laughs> uh, it all depends. Like it all, this is this all comes out of the um, business. You know, this all comes out of like what you what you're actually uh, doing. Like, what's the real world? If, I, like, I say real world mental models, but a lot of the stuff we do is always digital. I used to work in an insurance company where it's really ancient, so it was kind of quite real world, but now we're now in payments, it was, it's all digital, so it's weird. But it, you, these are real things. These, these are real things which the, the, the subject matter experts understand. So um, it, the, the, the objects you have in your code, they are the way that... Um, the subject matter expert understands them. So, for example, when, when I was at Simply Business, uh, we would have an, un an insurance underwriter. So the things we named the objects in the system were what they call them. And that's, so they might be generic, but that's what they understand them to be. So that's what we have to understand them to be. So I guess it's making sure you're talking to so the people designing the product as well and making sure they've, they've got to be key to this process and they're going to be part of this process don't try and do it as developers alone try and bring in the people who are we're designing and building the the, the product uh, roadmap as well yeah, if anything that's all the range of design is it's just it's just a framework to help that journey um for your company would you put authentication as a core supporting or generic element i guess <laughs> um i don't know if that's that it's kind of it's a bit of both, actually, because we... It's a similar to, one, isn't it? It's a similar sort of struggle to answer that, isn't it? It depends yeah. on approach. Yeah. Yeah. It does, it does depend on the approach. I think, for me, like, obviously the payments is our, our core domain, but there's certain things we have to do where um, authentication is very important because we are moving money around. So, yeah, it is a, it's probably a... It's, a, it's probably something... But, again, that comes from the business, though. It's the business who decides it's the core domain. It's not me as an engineer. It's the business who say this is this is the um, thing that matters. Um, next one down is how does an event storming session work online? If you do this with a larger group, do you use tools to facilitate it? Uh, Miro, etc. Yeah, so so Miro is pretty good for it. Um, uh, whimsical so I think I said notion earlier but no Miro is the one I was thinking about actually so I said that thanks but yeah so what what's yeah, what yeah. I've done them all um online since the last two years but when we used to do them before Covid something we have lost is um 
when you do them in a room, it's easier to get people because you kind of write, you have the different colored post-its for the events and the commands and things. And it's easier to get people to just you know, like stick things on the wall. Like it's easier to get introverts to stick things on the wall they're worried about. When it's, I, I do notice when it's on a, when you do it digitally, people are a bit scared because everyone's watching them, but that's all we can do. But yeah, I think actually it's Miro is the best tool. Uh, Google Jamboard is pretty good as well, but Miro, I think I find Miro is actually the best one. Uh, how does an event storming, sorry, I've done that one, sorry. Do you recommend running event storming sessions just at the beginning uh, of building a new product? Or is it better to run these, say, quarterly as product evolves? So, yeah, I guess that's a good question. Probably probably both. Yeah, both. Said. Yeah, both. And, I, and I also, like, it would, yeah, definitely run it and start, but also carry on doing it. I suppose it does depend on the complexity of, of, of what you, you're doing as well. Um, like, if you're lucky, maybe you wouldn't, but it doesn't hurt doing it again. Um, if it, it's not like, I'd rather waste someone's time than not do it, if you know what I mean? But yeah, ca carry on doing it, because you're, you're, what you tend to do, like, like with anything, like we all know, is you'll you're, you're, you're start your work and then a few sprints in, you're just like, oh, there's these edge cases you didn't even think about. So always, always come back if you need to. Brilliant. That's the, that's the questions there for, uh, from us. And thanks for all the answers. And uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, there's plenty to, to get thinking about. I, I'm, I'm trying to learn a lot about event storming myself. So that's given me a bit of a starter, I think, as well. Oh, thanks very much. Um, um, over to you, Isaac. Do the wrap up. Yeah, just want to say thanks, guys. Um, it's never easy putting yourself out there like you have done uh, and to put on, you know, um, a, a decent, interesting talk for, for, for the community is something to be highly recognised for. So I just want to say well done and thank you again, especially giving up your time, you know, not just to do the talk, but to pre prepare the talk, prepare the slides and stuff like that, all the work that goes in. Um, thanks as well to everyone who's involved in, um, you know, organising this meetup, the the work that goes in behind the scenes, Martin, Louisa, Mark, Andy, you, you're all great. Um, but yeah, that is a wrap, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, I really, again, to, to you, giving up your time, coming, making this possible. Really appreciate that.